there were there were two questions in the Facebook group uh, about uh, optimizing biomechanics from Gavin Chester and Ross Quigley. Uh, so Gavin asked, uh, how important is, quote unquote, optimizing biomechanics for hypertrophy, for example, adjusting line of resistance with the direction of the muscle fibers, et cetera. Ross chimed in, I second this. I see a lot of Instagram accounts that go into detail on both lines of resistance, strength slash resistance curves, active range of motion for a given muscle, et cetera. And basically, like, how important is that stuff? Do you need to be concerned about it? Um and, uh, yeah, so my perspective is that <laughs> it's hard, it's hard to know. So, so this is a, uh, partially scientific answer and partially just my opinion and vibes based answer. Uh, and, and the reason it's hard to give a, sci a fully scientific answer to this is that, uh, a lot of the ideas that, that people are putting forth are, not directly tested so like you know for example if you say a particular type of way of doing cable rows is going to build your rhomboids way more than some standard way of doing maybe like uh, uh inclined bench dumbbell rows like you're you're it's your prerogative to make that claim uh but that hasn't been researched so you know could be correct could be incorrect um but it, it's hard to objectively say. So, you know, we, we are mostly in the realm of opinion and conjecture here. Uh, but my perspective is that it's probably a matter of degree. Um, and, and for example, the principle itself of, of different exercises or different variations of exercises maybe being more or less effective for hypertrophy in general or hypertrophy of a particular region of a muscle, um, that general idea does have some scientific support. Uh, so again, not support for specific individual exercises, but just kind of the concept itself. So for example, there's, um, there's one study showing that incline bench builds the upper pecs better than flat bench. We've talked about that on the podcast before. I'm a little bit skeptical of that study, but just noting that, that it exists. Um, <laughs> there's a recent study showing that, uh, knee extensions build the rectus femoris way better than, uh, like squats do. So, you know, you can't necessarily assume that all quad exercises will build all heads of the quads equally. Uh, there's a study showing that bench press and triceps build like different heads or, uh, uh bench press and tricep extensions build different heads of the triceps. So for example, uh, bench press seemed to be really good for specifically building the lateral head of the tricep, uh, whereas the long head of the tricep was grown a lot more effectively with like skull crushers. Um, so there's there's direct evidence on that. Uh, and then just regional muscle activation in response to different exercises and uh, regional muscle hypertrophy are are pretty well established phenomena at this point. So just kind of on a baseline level, there is there is reason to believe that, um, you know, attempting to, to quote unquote, optimize exercises for particular, like to target particular muscles, um, might have some merit, even if there's not direct evidence for the specific exercises or exercise variations being discussed. Um, and there's also some research showing that relatively small, uh, quote unquote, optimizations can have a notable effect effect on hypertrophy. So it's not just a matter of, say, bench press versus tricep extensions for different heads of the triceps. Even relatively small variations of the same general exercise may be more or less effective. So there was a study by um, Mayo, uh, I believe, from this past year looking at uh, hypertrophy of the hamstrings following seated or lying hamstring curls finding that seated hamstring curls were uh, quite a bit more effective for hypertrophy, probably because they they were training the hamstrings at a longer muscle length. So if you're seated, you're in some hip flexion that lengthens the hamstrings, might make seated leg curls a little bit more effective for hamstring growth than lying leg curls. So there, there even is some evidence that uh, the relatively small, quote unquote, optimizations like that could be effective. Um, Personally, I, I do think that the most important factors uh, are just 
um, range of motion. So for example, can you load the target muscle at relatively long muscle lengths, like near the end of its range of motion? Uh, and also just whether the exercise you're doing um, is likely to be limited by the muscle you're the most interested in. So, you know, for example, um, take dumbbell bench versus bench press. Some people's bench press performance might be limited by their triceps or by their shoulders. And for them, maybe the bench press might not be the most effective uh, pec builder. But with dumbbell press, for example, for virtually everyone, that's going to be limited by their pecs. So, you know, that would probably tend to make it uh, an effective pec exercise for most people. Um, so I, I think those are the two biggest factors, just range of motion and, and whether or not the target muscle is going to be the limiting muscle for uh, the exercise being performed. And the other caveat I'd throw in is that I think for biarticular muscles, there's some decent evidence to suggest that single joint exercises tend to be more effective than multi-joint exercises. So uh, I mentioned tricep extensions versus bench press for uh, growth of the long head of the triceps. Tricep extensions were more effective. Long head of the tricep is a multi-joint muscle. Um, and same thing with uh, knee extensions for rectus femoris growth. Again, um, the rectus femoris is a biarticular muscle. Single joint exercise seemed to be better. So, you know, I, I think that those are the main factors to keep in mind, whether or not optimizations past that point make much of a difference. I'm kind of agnostic on. Um, and uh, I, I think that I, I think that in general, a, a way to approach it is just kind of to ask yourself whether you need something fresh for, for a particular muscle or not. So, you know, for example, if you've got pretty big pecs and you feel most kind of standard pec exercises in your pecs, they feel pretty pumped, pretty fatigued after you do some pec training. I don't think you need to go out seeking crazy new pec exercises. Like you certainly could just if you want something new to do for novelty's sake, but I personally don't think it's going to affect your, your results all that much. However, if there is a particular muscle group where like just the, the standard go-to exercises don't really seem to be doing it for you. So uh, I, I think like lats are a pretty common one. A lot of people don't feel their lats as much as they would like to if they if they were doing uh, pull-ups, pull-downs, pull-overs, just kind of like standard lat exercises. Uh, and, and maybe they have relatively poor lat development compared to the rest of their physique. If you come across someone on Instagram or some other platform saying like, here are some crazy new lat exercises that, that will really blow up your lats and help you feel your lats contract and doing what you want them to uh, if pull downs aren't getting the job done for you. I mean, my perspective is it, it doesn't hurt to give it a shot. Um, you know, if what you're current currently doing isn't working, uh, at minimum, it, it doesn't hurt to try out a new idea. I do think that a lot of the kind of, I, I think that a lot of the reasoning underpinning a lot of the exercises be, that, that might be recommended kind of under the umbrella or for the purpose of like, quote unquote, optimizing exercise technique. I, I do think that the, the reasoning some might be a little bit flimsy at times. And it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like keto content. So they, they both kind of go with like, here's a plausible sounding mechanism. I tried this thing and it seemed to work for me. Uh, and therefore we can generalize it and, and it's a good thing for everyone. So in, in the case of keto, like, hey, uh, like insulin is this thing. And like, oh, that, that seems scary. And like, I tried a low carb diet. Uh, help me control my appetite and lose weight. Therefore, like low carb keto is the best. Everyone should do it. And, and I, I get kind of the same vibe from the kind of like galaxy brain, like exercise variation stuff. Like, oh man, if you like do, do rows on this exact machine in this exact way, like it technically lines up with like the, the line of pull for this region of your lats a little bit better. And like, I tried it and, I got a I got a pretty good pump off of it. So like, 
everyone should do it this way. This is this is way better than the typical way of doing this exercise. I don't know. To to me, it seems like it. It seems like some of that content makes some jumps that are somewhat unjustifiable, and at minimum, makes claims with more with with a with a higher level of confidence than is fully justifiable like you know here's a plausible mechanism and it seemed to feel good for me uh i i don't think is enough evidence to therefore recommend it as a generally superior thing for everyone um so yeah i i some of it leaves a bad taste in my mouth but i i think i have a um I, I think I have a generally sympathetic perspective to it. Um, like I said, I, I think most of the time the old standards get the job done for most people, but I also think it, it doesn't hurt to have more tools in the toolbox. If there are some muscle groups that say just, just aren't, aren't going well for you. Like the stand, the, the old classic exercises don't really seem to be doing what you want them to do. Or if you're a coach and you train clients and like, you know, uh, for, for a particular client, they just, for whatever reason, feel uh, like RDLs in their glutes and they feel leg curls in their fucking calves because your gastroc is also uh, technically a knee flexor. And like, man, this client just can't grow their hamstrings. Like, what do I do? You know, I, I don't think it hurts to consume some of that content because if someone has a, a galaxy brain idea for a novel hamstring exercise doesn't hurt to know it exists to try it out with a client who might be struggling to feel their hamstrings working with with kind of classic hamstring exercises so I, i'm sympathetic to it overall but I, I do think a lot of that content um kind of like overstates what the the reasoning and evidence that backs it up but like i said i i, I would say i'm vaguely sympathetic towards it have you come across any great exercises to really light up your popliteus? Because I could use some of those if, if you have any. I have not. Although I will say, uh, here here's kind of a weird looking, but uh, like galaxy brain, like quote unquote, like optimized version of an exercise that I thought looked ridiculous um, before I tried it and now absolutely love. Uh, and also this, uh, this exercise comes from like one of only three T nation articles that I regularly share with people. So, uh, John Meadows had a really good T nation article back in the day. I maybe it, it may have been like 2011, 2012. Like it, it was, it, it was qu quite a bit in the past, uh, but it, it was on shoulder training. And, uh, one of the things I had always noticed is like, I never felt my rear delts doing anything. Like if I just did kind of like normal rear delt raises, they'd get, they'd get a little bit of a pump, but like I'd mostly feel it in my rhomboids and mid traps. Um, and I didn't have particularly good rear delt growth, which was actually a problem for me as a power lifter. Cause I had no shelf for low bar squatting. Uh, and like I wanted to, I wanted to try low bar, high bar seemed to be fine, but I had zero rear delt development. So uh, like I could do singles for low bar squats, but if I tried to do reps, the bar would start sliding. Uh, and so I come, I come across this T Nation article uh, by by John Meadows, who I liked and respected, uh, seemed seemed to be putting out good content. And so uh, the rear delt exercise he recommended was you basically just take way heavier dumbbells than you could possibly do full range of motion with. And you're basically face down on a bench and doing like super partial range of motion rear delt raises. Um, and you know, you're, you're intentionally trying to relax your scapulae and not like retract on every rep. And so you're just doing like little swings that you're only using your rear delts for. Uh, and then you're also trying to like make sure the dumbbells don't hit at the bottom. So like, there is still some eccentric component where you're using your rear delts to decelerate the dumbbells so they don't cling together at the bottom of every rep. And I got to say, man, I love them. They're great. That's the only rear delt exercise that really blows up my rear delts. They, they, they're they fucking toasted at the end. They're the only things that make my rear delts sore. And I got some some very solid rear delt growth out of them. Uh, they, they finally gave me that shelf to where I could uh, 
uh, rest the bar pretty comfortably for low bar squats. So yeah, I, I'm I'm sympathetic to the idea. I, I just think that that sometimes people overplay their hands, um, and you know, I, I see it less personally. I see it less of like here are more optimized versions of exercises that are going to work way better for people. And I see it more of like. I had a creative idea for how you could target this muscle. And if you struggle to target this muscle, uh, here, here's an idea to try out like that. That's how I personally, uh, interact with, with content like that. Um, so yeah, you can, you can view it however you please.